I'm going to shorten my message. I didn't get an amen on that either. <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase. Um, Jason, I appreciate you sharing that. And you know my phone number, you know where I live, you know where we live, you've always got a place, you've just, we've, you've always got family. And I've got some family here tonight. And uh, my Uncle Harry and his wife, Linda, and my aunt and uncle are right here back here, and they're very special to us. Our stepmother, Betty, is right down here on the third pew. Uh, family member, Ronnie Tanner. Ronnie's a cousin, a little bit distant, but he's a cousin, and he's a friend on Facebook. You know, there's uh, Facebook decorum. And Ronnie has got this right. See, a lot of people, they see each other, their friends on Facebook, and you get out in public and you see somebody, it's like, well, do I speak? <laughs> and so one day I found myself over at J&J &J when it was still an operational here, and this girl in front of me was about three years ahead of me in the band in North Hall, and she was a flute player, and, and we're friends on Facebook. Facebook was new. And I'm sitting there thinking, do I speak? Do I speak? And finally I said, hey, how are you? It's like, bye. You know, just, and that was just it. <laughs> but... Uh, Family is important. Uh, Ronnie is a friend on Facebook. He's a he's family member too. Uh, I had a real long message planned, and it's uh, it was entitled "Left Behind." And I know when people see the title or hear the title "Left Behind," they think, "Isn't that the movie that Kurt Cameron was in?" And it was, but this has nothing to do with Kurt Cameron or that kind of "Left Behind." Uh, it's in actually in Numbers chapter 13, and I'm going to switch glasses here. I've, you know, I've learned a lot going with the Golden Agers. I, I wonder when I first started going with the Golden Agers, you know, they t I said to myself, they talk an awful lot about feeling bad and about stuff that and stuff that's going wrong and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, why do they talk talk about that like that? Well, I'm finding out. <laughs> and I used to think it was the funniest thing for a piano player, you know, if they're sitting at the piano and they do this number like this and, wh and what they're trying to do is they're trying to grab that bifocal it's not funny anymore <laughs> not funny at all but uh anyway i just uh it just entitled left behind uh i'm just going to read and hit high points and uh and uh, i want to come to a point and i think it would go along with what jason had actually sung about that i should still go free I should still go free, but it's called Left Behind, and this is how I've tried to live my life and the way I think we ought to live our lives. But anyway, uh, in Numbers chapter 13, verses uh, 1, through 1, 2, and 3, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites from each ancestral tribe. Send one of its leaders. So uh, this, this going to explore the land was nothing that, that man decided. Moses didn't decide this. This was God's instruction and it was to be followed. God's instruction was to go and look. And it's not so much that I think they were going to, to look and, and approve as much as they were going to look and see what the beauty was that he was giving to them. Uh, notice it says in that verse, uh, some men to explore the land which I am giving to the Israelites. The land belonged to God. It was God's land. It was his, uh, he was his all along. Just like the things that we have right now, you know, we may think that they belong to us, but they actually belong to God. And so he says, go, and so he sends these spies. Now, if you look in the next section, uh, that was the command, God's command. The next section is God's committee, the committee. And so if you read down through there, and I'm not going to read through this because we had a real hard time in our Sunday school class this morning with the name of Mephibosheth. And I just don't think I can get all these through tonight, so we're just going to say that there are 12, 12 representatives of the 12 tribes of Judah. Everyone was included as far as the 12 tribes of Judah. No one was left out. It included all. And including all, uh, these were men that were considered to be leaders. And the first thing that I thought of when I started talking and seeing what, what they were leaders is what does it take to make a good leader? And here's a, here you go. I feel like Red Skelton. <laughs> see, I can see now. All right, there y'all are. full-time ministry I worked at a business a canter machine company and so I understand management I understand how a business works and, and I know there are a lot of things about a business and how to run an operation to do it and do it well and a business will rise and fall on the quality of the leaders that are in place and so I got thinking well a leader ought to be someone that could focus someone that can focus and stay on task 
A leader ought to be someone with courage because you have to make decisions. I think, now this is not always the way it is today, but I think a leader ought to be someone for, for, with integrity because that's going to be someone you can trust. We live in a world that, that, that craves integrity. Uh, also, someone with determination. How many people do you see that are, that are on the right track on something and they suddenly quit? Or they get just a little bit of a challenge and they stop. They need the determination to go forward. No matter what's happening, just to keep pushing and pushing on. That's a good leader. Uh, and also, uh, wisdom. Wisdom is missing today, by the way. Knowing, this, knowing, knowing good decisions from bad decisions. Wisdom. It's hard to find. It's hard to find. We ought to seek after wisdom. Uh, foresight. Knowing that today is not the only day. Knowing that there are things coming in the future. Knowing that, that, that we have to prepare to go forward with foresight. Have you ever seen anybody just seem to be stuck in the right now? They can't see, they can't see, but they, they can look at the past, but they cannot see or imagine the future and what that would be like. Foresight. Foresight. Character. And that goes to integrity. Character. Someone with good character. I had someone use one time a, a term, and you guys that have been in business, some of you might have had a business degree, but they use a term and they call it uh, business ethics. And all that meant was, all that meant was you could kind of cut corners, do a few things under the table, and it's okay, and that's for the name of business. Is that right? Is that a good definition of that? Business ethics. Well, see, character, character is important. But I, I notice that of all these things, now, these would be great in a business. And they would be great in the church, except for there's one thing missing if you're going to apply this to the church. And that is faith. Faith. We're in a, we're in a line of work, if you would. We're in a line of work that requires a belief in something that we cannot see. We, we don't have the answers. We, we have to take things at faith. And that's hard. Now, one year, one church I was at, they got the bright idea on nominating me. It's not this church. But I want this boss to clarify. It's not New Holland. But they got the idea. We're going to put all the business people on finance committee. That would be the greatest thing. They about drove themselves crazy trying to rationalize all kinds of stuff. And they gave us, if you have been in church, examples about planting corn and setting corn aside and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, what do they have to do with corn? But the thing is, it is and what they did was basically handcuffed the church for that entire year because they could see nothing as far as financing and funding ministries that had to go on. I mean, if you, if you shut business, if you shut ministries down, you're, you're closing the doors. And that's what they did. So we were liberated a year later. The church got back on track. But you've got to have faith. And see, faith is an important thing as we look at the children of Israel about to go and explore the same faith. Faith because what they're going to see is going to be intimidating. But that's not the reason God sent them. You know examples as well as I do of leadership failing to do what it's supposed to do. Well, the next thing that happens is the charge. And this is verse 17, verse 17 through 20. It says, When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it a good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Or, or excuse me, are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season of the first ripe grapes. So, you read these things, and this is what Moses has set out that they're to look for. Well, were they to look for this and to look at it under the name of approving of it? Or were they seeing this to try to understand and explain to those that they were, that they were exploring for? The grandeur, the wonder of everything that God was about to provide for them. Did God send them in to make sure? send them in to let them see that they may join his vision and see what he's going to do. But they didn't think that way. It does say if you go on to the conquest. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Lebo, Hamath. 
They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahim, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster, a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So let's just, let's just talk about this. What did they find? It was everything that God said it would be. It was beyond description. Yet, what happened? They came back. They give report. This says, they came back to Moses. This is verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them in the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. So they, they come back and they show them the fruit of the land. And, and they say, this is what we've seen. And then they say this. Here is, here is its fruit. Here is its fruit. But you always know trouble's coming after you get the word but. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live there near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So they see the fruit, and everybody's amazed at it. They tell about it. But then they immediately go into this reasoning about why they cannot take the land. And the more we read, the more we see they basically are factoring God out of the whole equation. Their eyes are on man at this point. What we can do, what we're able to accomplish, what we're able to conquer. One voice, Caleb says, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we certainly can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. Can you hear how sensational it's getting all of a sudden? They were going to talk it to death. Now, I don't know if you know this. This is the way things go in churches sometimes. Just talk it to death. Just keep on talking. Keep on talking. We used to have this thing that just gave you a play that can't be shoot. It's called Sergeant Rome. Where you work, and somebody got that game play, start a room. I really felt like sometimes management was sitting in the office up there seeing what the rumor was going to be. They say, Son, you know what's not a bad idea. And they said, What the rumor said. I said, All right, I'm serious. But the thing is, is what we see is they talked it to death. And the, the thought came to mind there's a certain beauty shop in a certain town that was so well known for talking down all the things that went on in a certain church in that area. Didn't matter what, the, what was right or wrong, just take it to the beauty shop. We'll figure it all out over there. And, and I, I'm not picking on women. It could be a barber shop, too. Talk it to death. Talk it down. It said, the land, it devours the people. Just very sensational. Their mind is already made up. They're not going. They don't want to go. It says, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the, the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and look the same to them. Now that's small to be a grasshopper in, in their own eyes. Maybe they hit the nail on the head when they said in our own eyes. Doesn't that say they basically put their faith in, in their, own, their own ways? Well, I had two pages of notes here I was going to share with you, but I'm going to make a transition. Well, God becomes angry. There's a flurry of activity. They're grumbling because here again, you hear the same thing. It would have been better for us to die in Egypt. They keep bringing that out. Every time things go bad, every time they come to challenge, it would have been better for us to die in Egypt. Now, we, we have a certain word for this in youth ministry that I was taught early on. Drama. It just sounds like drama. We we could die in Egypt. We could have something to eat there. We could beat the daylights out of it. But hey, we could have food. We had a steady job. Got to think about that for just a minute. Yeah. 
Verse 26 of chapter 14, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumblings, Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do it to you and the very things I heard you say. In other words, they've said that they're going to die in the desert to be better. They're going to, he's going to let them die in the desert. He says, Every one of you 20 years old or more who has counted in, was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land, I swore with uplifted hand, to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Okay, now... As we look at this, there was a tremendous cost. And I think that that generation saw it. And let's talk about the word generation for just a moment. We have generations in the church. There's an older generation, a middle generation, a younger generation. They missed it. There was no going back. It was over for them. But God keeps his promises. In Joshua 21, verse 43, it says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Now, as I considered this, I, I know that when I usually preach, I'm kind of thematic. I, I'm a revivalist more than anything. I preach to the church. I, I'm not an evangelist. I preach to the church. That's, that's what I do. That's where my forte is. But the way you build a strong church is not to build an organization more than you build people. You've got to build people. That, that's the only way a church is going to grow is you've got to build people. You've got to disciple. You've got to invest the maturity and the, the wisdom into people. And I got thinking about what life is like be like for an Israelite in the desert, but then I got thinking about what is life like for us? Because, you know, Jason talked about it, and, and I'm sure if we went around the room, others have dealt with depression. I know they have. What happens when you find yourself as an individual in the desert? In the desert. There's no life in the desert. There's no joy in the desert. Something just came to me. Verse 6 of Isaiah 55 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. See, people make a mess out of life. I don't know. See, I don't know if you've ever dealt with that. I don't know if you know anybody that has made a mess out of their life. I have. And see, we tend to find people who make a mess of their lives and we, we don't support them as much as we put them down. We don't reach out. We don't try to help. We don't try to encourage. We, don't, we just wonder why we can't get it together. See, the church, the church is God's mechanism for, for showing kindness to people. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. There are people who need the encouragement that we have to offer. Because there are people right now that are in a desert of some way, shape, or form that are not interested in how you're going to fix or make the church bigger. 